into the top 30 of our top 50 Big Ten players countdown for the upcoming season. Number 30 is the third Purdue Boilermaker on this list. That would be Fletcher Lawyer, a.k.a. one half of the, quote, winningest backcourt in America. That's a quote from Boiler Ball, Purdue Ball. Uh, that Not wrong. Not wrong. As far as returning players, Fletcher Lawyer and Braden Smith are the winningest backcourt in the country. These kids started as freshmen together. They started as sophomores together, went to a national championship game, won a bunch of games along the way, and uh, they're back for more as upperclassmen for the first time. Craig Bowers, Joe Jackson with me to help break down Fletcher Lawyer. If you want to see the previous two videos we did on Purdue in this series, they're up on the channel now. Fletch is a very polarizing player, as you guys know. Uh, I think he, given how promising the beginning of his freshman year looked I feel like there's always been this expectation or just hope from Purdue fans and people broader of like imagine what he can be and then he hit a wall his freshman year and then his sophomore year he was like super quietly the best shooter in the conference and nobody really gave him the credit for that because Braden was so good and Zach Eady was doing Zach Eady things so I almost feel like we've reached a point here where Fletcher Lawyer is underappreciated. And maybe I'm a part of that conversation. He's 30th on our list. I think he was 24th on the inside the hall and UM hoops list. So around the same range, but I'll throw it to you first, Craig. Is this too high or too low or just right for Fletcher Lawyer? I don't think it's too high. <laughs> um, really, really, again, I, I keep saying this, but I think it's about right. Um, but I do think there's a world where he's one of the top 15 players in the conference at the end of this season and makes at least like a third team, all big 10 team, um, for, for a few different reasons. But like you said, um, quietly the best shooter in the big 10 last year, last 11 games of the season, he shot 58% in um, yeah, in the last 11 games of the season last year, 44% for the year. You saw him go off for 27 against Tennessee and I think 27 against Bama. Am I right on that, Joe? Yeah. I he or not Bama. No, he, not Bama. Arizona and Arizona, right. Arizona and Tennessee. Um, but we we know what he can do. Um, but last year, when you have two time national player of the year who's sometimes putting in 40, and when people would kind of be like, Well, why was Fletch quiet that game? Well, if you're gonna guard Edie one on one, Painter's just gonna keep throwing him the ball. I heard him talk about that today in regards to the UConn game about, well, people saying, why didn't we let Fletcher shoot threes? And he's like, they were letting the best player in the country the last two years go one-on-one. -on -one. Like we were going to give him the ball as much as he wanted. We could give him the ball. I had him, I think 30th on our list. So I'm going to say it's exactly right. <laughs> um, and when I think through Fletch, I've, I think I've ranted two separate times on boilers in the stands and maybe even a small Twitter thing of like, why, like, why isn't Fletch acknowledged as one of the best shooters, maybe the best shooter in the conference. And why does that not matter for Fletch specifically? I think it's, you brought it up, Greg, like the, the initial um, kind of start to his career, maybe altered expectations a bit. And, and I will never say that Fletch is without faults, but like, one of the best shooters in the conference could score the ball understood, like was a good part of the rotation, understood where the ball needed to go, did some of the little things. Um, I think it's what his, I think what the public or not the public issue, the issue that he has about being publicly perceived is that his flaws are very loud. And I think that makes it easier for people to latch on that. He's like worse than what he is. That's a long winded way of me saying, I think he's exactly right where we have him ranked yeah i mean you nailed it credit to you i had him 27th for the record i was actually the highest of the three yes. of us on fletcher rankings and uh carter elliott the other co-host of mine had him 30 let me check 39th that seems low but that's on brand for carter no 36 36 30 36, 36 was the number for fletch so somewhere between 25 and 36 seems like the general range for fletcher lawyer and i, I don't I don't think I have too much pushback on the upper or bottom end of that. He's 30th on our list. Here we go. Um, let me do my best to try and diagnose what a critic would say, a Fletcher lawyer based on last season. And then you guys tell me how off base this is. I think 
while his numbers from three percentage wise rocketed through the roof and he led the league in it, his attempts dropped from his freshman year to his sophomore year. His minutes per game dropped from freshman year to sophomore year. His minutes per game in conference play went down from non-conference play his sophomore year. Not, not a lot, but this is a guy who was the best shooter in the league, shot 48.5% from three in conference play last year in 20 games, and only played 27 minutes? Like, something to me just doesn't add up there. And I know Lance Jones was brought in, and he's a guard too, but I think that's sort of the limiting thing to me here is like, why didn't Purdue want him on the floor more if he was that important to what they were trying to do last year? Yeah, I think like, I think there's this, the concept of like, there's almost like a max usage players have. And this kind of an idea I hold of like, you can give a player a certain usage and it is beneficial and you can keep adding up to a certain point. And then after that, even if they're still like putting up good numbers, um, the added usage is just like decreases who they are overall. And then you look at Purdue specifically who brings in Lance Jones, who Camden Heidi is emerging more towards the later, later end of the season. Guys like that, um, it can eat into his minutes. I, like I think that 28 minutes per game that he was at, like, maybe bumps a little bit this year, but I think that's close to the perfect role for him of like, he can play 28 to 30 minutes, give you really good minutes in that time. Um, maybe isn't a 36 minute per game dude though. And that's just kind of who he is. Craig, do you agree with that? Um, I do, but I also think when you just look at last year's team and we talk about Fletcher's three point percentage, you also had Mason shooting 45%. You also had Cam shooting 45%. You also had Braden shooting over 40%, Miles shooting over 40%. And by the way, Lance Jones was in the high 30s. So then when you look at that for a specific matchup, and if you're saying, okay, well, we know Fletch isn't the greatest defender out there, but we can bring Cam in and slide him at the three, and we can push Lance over to the two. And as long as those other guys are still knocking down threes, what they bring defensively in certain matchups, I think just took some of his minutes away. Um, that would be my perception. It's a good perception because defense is a big part of Fletch here. Joe, were you going to say something? I was just going to also start. You have to remember in terms of the uh, shot usage, he shared the floor a lot with Lance Jones as the off ball guard and Lance is not scared to uh, put him up. <laughs> we know that for sure. Um, okay. That's good insight. So thank you guys for the context on that. I, um, so I, I've been trying for two years now to place what exactly it is about a night where Fletch goes for 27 points against one of the best defenses in the country, and then what it is when he goes for zero against whoever, right? Like, Because he does have a very wide range of game-to-game -game outcomes in a way that I don't think you would expect for a guy as consistent as Fletcher's numbers say he is offensively. So it, when you do your best to pinpoint what has happened on a night where Fletch is bad Fletch versus a night where Fletch is incredible Fletch is it mental or is it the way teams guard him what is it that leads to that wide disparity when you're talking about one of the best defensive teams um sorry if that was supposed to go to Joe when you're talking about one of the best defensive teams you're talking about Tennessee I I is think that... there's, a, there's a couple examples of Fletch like popping off games to me against good defenses Tennessee Arizona was one. Arizona was top 10 defense Tennessee is number three uh, okay. Just, I, I mean, I would just say with Tennessee, like, yeah, they're incredible defensively, but he was getting guarded by Dalton connect. Who's not incredible defensively. So sure. I, I think Arizona two weeks later, or three weeks later, whatever yeah. it was doing the same thing. Um, but I, again, I don't know who was guarding him. Maybe they had, I don't know who the worst defender on Arizona was. <laughs> Caleb love probably <laughs> like it's probably Larson. If I Larson. recall correctly. Yeah. Um, so, but I guess the point is like, if it's matchup dependent, I think I, Fletch usually, usually saw the weakest defender probably. Right. So how does depends. that add up to like he, that stretch in big 10 play where he just couldn't hit a three. Was that confidence or was he seeing great defenders from Michigan and Minnesota? <laughs> he was seeing game plans to in part. And, and some of it is just the natural streakiness of Fletch. Uh, I'm not, 
trying to downplay that part because it is. I mean, he put up four against Alabama, and then the next game put up 27 against Arizona. Like, it is there. But that stretch specifically, um, I think you saw a lot of teams, and I think Painter even talked about it, of, like, teams focused on taking Fletch away and just didn't want him to get going. It was kind of a – Edie's going to get his. Brain pro- is proven he's going to do what he can do because he's Brain Smith. Let's cut off everything else. And, I mean, you even saw it in the UConn game of – UConn, uh, the championship game. UConn was like, hey, we're just going to play two on two. Nobody else is going to touch the ball. If Edie and Smith can combine for 80 points, we lose. Oh, well. Um, And there's that mixed in with Fletch having streakiness mixed in with there's just some matchup. He he gets overpowered. And I think that's probably the biggest thing is there's just there's sometimes he just gets overpowered. And then that's when the issues can start when it's like on him. Yeah. Okay. That's great insight. Uh, speaking of the the concept of Fletch being overpowered, the photos went viral earlier this summer. It, he doesn't exactly photograph as a guy who has made much progress in the weight room. Craig, you've seen practice behind the scenes. It, it, you can probably dispute this based on what you've seen yourself. But I guess, do you think that just progression physically has been an issue for Fletcher? And I guess, why is it an issue if it has been? I think it's a little bit hard to say because I think there's some guys that just when they make any gains from a muscularity standpoint from lifting weights that that show it very visibly. Um, And we have to think about where Fletch started, too. (laughs) So I I think a guy like Fletch can add a lot to his core and, and still add muscle without maybe necessarily it being super visible in a picture. I know from talking to some guys around the program, um, you know, they've seen the gains in terms of just uh, what he's doing in the weight room progressively from one year to the next, from month to month. But um, I don't think it's easy for him to, I I don't think he's ever going to walk on the court and, you know, look like a cut up TKR uh, (laughs) when he flexes his arms or anything. But I I do think he's making gains to some degree. That would be something if he did like that. I would love to see what a beefed up flesh and lawyer looks like even if it's post basketball one day it'd just be funny um okay so back to our our top 50 list i'm gonna spoil some things briefly here maybe one thing uh fletch fletch comes up in this list in a very interesting pocket to me because in a six player span we have high barry from northwestern a shooting guard that's a high volume three-point shooter he was 33rd on the list we have Benham Rickhouse, 32nd for Illinois. Not a shooting guard, but a guy that's a transfer in that we project to be basically just a shooter. We have Fletcher Lawyer, 30th, just ahead of Ty Berry and Rickhouse. And then we have soon to be upcoming on the list, Michigan State's Jade Nakins. And I won't reveal where he is, but Jade Nakins is a few spots ahead of Fletcher Lawyer on this list. And I don't have any major issue with that in sequence saying Ty Berry is worse than Ben Rickhouse is worse than Fletcher Lawyer is worse than Jade Nakins. But this became a very hot topic in the sleepers discord of like, would you take Fletcher Lawyer or Jade Nakins? And I, I mean, the fans of each team were 100%. I would take our guy. And I understand why the argument for Fletch is, well, he wins. The argument for Michigan state is, well, our guy defends and would also win if he played next to Braden Smith and Zach Eady. So I want to know from you guys, does Fletch belong at the top of these other guys? Because I, I started thinking about it. I think Ty Berry would look pretty damn good in a Matt Painter system next to these guys. And I'm trying to envision what Fletcher would look like on Northwestern. And I don't know what it would look like. What do you think, Craig? I mean, that's... That's a question. <laughs> like, where where does he, all those other players fit if you throw him next to one of the best point guards in the country, probably the best point guard in the country and a two-time national player of the year. So, I, I mean, I think everybody looks better in that situation. But, you know, you bring up Aikens to me, I, I think you could, not defensively, but I think you could bring up some of the same questions of like, well, Aikens kind of disappeared in, in game sometimes. And why wasn't he ever consistently doing it at a high level? Um <clears throat> I'm going to defer to Joe on most of those guys on that list. Joe follows the rest of the Big Ten a lot closer than I do. I like where he's at um, in that list. Like, Fletch Laurie on Northwestern, we get so many open threes. Chris Collins would scheme him every which way possible. (laughs) Um, Like, he just would. 
Hamakaos, like, yeah, I mean, they're they're a little bit more different players. He's a stretch four. Lawyer's an off ball guard. Um, Akins, I like a little bit higher just because of the defense, and they do similar ish things offensively. Um, yeah, I I think like I, I kind of goes back to the beginning. I think that's kind of just the right spot. Of he is very good at what he's done. Um, I think he could be adapted to different roles if thrown, but like, he, yeah, there's there's a case that he's probably in like one of if not the best spot possible for him. Do you like, I don't know, do you discredit a guy for that? I, I don't know the answer, I guess, to that. Yeah, no, I, I don't think you should. Like, I, I think Fletcher does not get enough credit for his role and how good Purdue has been. And it makes sense to me why he doesn't, because his limitations are what they are. And quite frankly, Braden and Zach Eady have been that good. But yeah. let's not forget that this has been a trio that has played all these minutes for three years. And um, I don't know. I just, I kind of see it both ways. Cause I do think like those other shooting guards probably give you more defensively than Fletch, but I think Fletcher's probably the smartest IQ of them offensively. He's definitely the best shooter of them offensively. And I also think he has some shit to his game offensively that maybe we won't even see this year when Braden Smith is there, but just point blank, I haven't seen Jay Nakins go put up 27 against good defenses. I haven't seen Ty Berry do anything other than just catch fire from three. And I think Fletcher has a little more versatility to what he can do offensively there. All right, uh, we've made it to superlative time. So we'll throw it to Craig first again here. What is Fletcher Lawyer's biggest strength? I, I think you hit the nail on the head just a second ago. I think it's his IQ on the floor um, and, and his ability to to read the situation and score in many different ways. We've seen him attack with that little mid range. We've seen him go all the way to the rim and take a beating and still finish at times. Um, and he just, he, he knows offensively what he's supposed to do so well to make everybody else better around him. He may not have crazy assist numbers or anything, but he knows in terms of spacing um, just what the team needs at any given point in time. And he can score in multiple ways. Yeah. Um, I would like, that's where I lean to is just the IQ because I think, and it is, if it's a common theme in the boilers in the stands, uh, live chat of like, what does he do if he's not shooting? And, and I think he provides a lot still of, I think he's an underrated passer. I, I think it's kind of last year, specifically the toss up was Colvin's the better athletic defender lawyer knew where he was supposed to be more, even if he just got punished more, there was that toss up, um, also, just he's an elite three point shooter. So, to not fully take Craig's, I'll just I'll throw that out there as well. You got to mention the best shooter in the country's biggest strength might be shooting, but you guys are right on with all the other stuff. I would add one more other stuff. I think experience is going to come into play for Fletch this year because I think you're hard pressed to find a guy who has experienced more individually in the last two years than Fletch. Like he has gone through big slumps, he has overcome big slumps. He has literally put up the best shooting season in the conference. And now like it, it kind of gets lost when we talk about the two guys that are lower on this list of, well, Colvin and Heidi have all this opportunity. So does Fletcher lawyer. Like it, it would not surprise me at all. If a lot of Lance Jones's stuff just gets moved on to Fletcher here in, instead of Colvin or Heidi. And maybe that's better for Purdue. Honestly, if Fletcher takes a bigger role and Heidi and Colvin can be brought along as role players still, I think I would buy that version of Purdue, maybe more so than one of the guys who's lower on our list breaking out. We'll see. What's your biggest question mark for Fletcher back to Craig. I mean, I think still it's, well, I'm, so I'm not going to take the easy one. Um, I think it's durability. Um, Cause I think in both seasons, I think he withstood it better throughout the season. I think most of that freshman wall was durability and kind of taking a beating, trying to go to the rim, uh, maybe more times than he should. Like <laughs> there's sometimes I'm like, go ahead and take that eight footer, buddy. Like it's right there for you. You're a great shooter. You don't have to attack the rim like that. Um, but just his ability to hold up even within game. Sometimes I think as he improves his core strength a little bit that, that that's going to improve. It mine's similar to that. It's like now that he's in year three and in theory, there could be even a bigger role for him. Can he adapt his style to be more efficient specifically from inside the arc? And like, it's kind of my, my, I guess it's my hot take on Fletch is like, obviously if he beefs up, it's probably a good thing in the long run. I don't think he needs to like, I don't, especially if I'm going to be back as a true two guard. I don't think it's a necessity. I think, 
what he can do to counter that is being able to jump stop more and gets eight feet and like the floater, like Craig said, or jump stop and kick out to one of the four shooters that's going to be on the floor for Purdue. Um, so can he adjust his game in like the little parts to kind of balance where he's at physically in the Big Ten while still being, you know, an elite shooter um, and an, and a high IQ player? A good one, too. I'm going to go back to my Aikens boss up here. And uh, my biggest question is, can he avoid going into the Aikens twilight zone, which is something I affectionately refer to as a guy who is asked to play a complimentary role repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly until all of a sudden it's his final year in a, in a uniform and they want that to change. And the, the big thing with Aikens was like, why isn't he breaking out? Well, because you have a ball dominant point guard next to him and another guy who's still really good in Tyson Walker. Of course, he's not breaking out. Now it's his final year and everybody wants Jay Nagins to be something he he's never been asked to do. We don't even know if he can do it. There is a little bit of that with Fletch here. And, and we may not even ever see him asked to do more because when you're that tight at the hip with Braden Smith in the same year of eligibility, you know, it almost is the perfect match in a lot of ways as long as Fletch stays in that role. And I guess with this team, it's the first time he might be asked to do more, but I kind of just wonder, like, is there more in the chamber? Does Purdue even want there to be more? And how does Fletch handle that mentally? That's probably my biggest question. Uh, what's a best case scenario season look like? Craig, you mentioned it wouldn't shock you if he was a top 15 player in this league. No, I, I think there's a world where he scores 15 points or more a game. And um, to, to your point about usage, if you listen to paint in basically any time he's been our, on air this postseason, he's mentioned at some point that the usage is going to increase for Fletcher and the actions that they run for Fletcher is going to change. They're going to run some stuff that they ran for Carson. They're going to run some stuff that they ran for Ryan Klein back to those 18, 19 days. Um, I he's going to have the opportunity to up his points per game a significant amount just because of what painter wants to do with him. That should be exciting to any flesh of lawyer fans out there, Joe. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, like, like 15 points a game is very doable. I think for him. Um, and honestly, even just some of it is if he can just become a little more efficient near or around the rim, like, uh, like it's, not unreasonable for him to take some sort of jump there, continue shooting the ball. Well, um, yeah, like just like the best third option in the conference. My answer is a little bit different here for just thinking Fletch individually. I think there's a world where Fletch is very clearly the second best player on Purdue. And that will require the guy who's next on the list here to underachieve relative to expectations in order for that to happen. We'll talk about that in a later video, but uh, to me, there is a world where he's like 16 a game, uh, a second, if not even, well, no, let's go second, second team, all big 10. It probably doesn't mean good things for Purdue if that's what happens, but I think it's out there. Uh, one to 10, how likely is it that the best case scenario comes to fruition? We'll throw it to Joe first. Uh, probably like, like the best case scenario, probably like a four. Cause the other part of it is just like, I, I think for him to hit the ceiling is also, you mentioned TKR. It's also dudes like Colvin, like Jakari Harris, like CJ Cox, like probably all not playing well and, and getting some usage. So I'll go like a four. Greg, I'm going to go a six. Um, I, I just think that Painter is going to give him every opportunity to become that guy. Yeah. And it's just a matter of whether he grabs that moment. I lean Craig's side of this too. I'm going to also go a six. I just, I feel most trusting a Fletcher out of this entire group of non Braden Smith. We need more from this bucket. Like I just, I think we know Fletcher's capable. We've seen him do it and I just trust him. I think he's probably the best player of that group. So uh, there you have it. What a polarizing guy, that Fletcher lawyer uh, 30th on our list. If you want to see the other Purdue player videos, we've got Craig and Joe for all of these and you can get more from them with boilers in the stands where they're covering Purdue all year long. Football season is here. Money is out there to be had in the form of winning bets. And our friends at MyBookie want to make it easy for you to do just that. Yeah, and coming into football season, you're going to have games all weekend happening everywhere. And Gregory, where is the only place that Sleepers Media places 
all bets. So I can tell you right now, since last February, February 1st to be exact, my bookie is the only place that I have placed a sports bet. I love my bookie. They make it easy. They get you quick payouts. They have awesome promo offers. In fact, card, they've got one right now that football fans everywhere and listeners of this show are going to want to take advantage of. Yeah, using promo code sleepers, that's promo code sleepers, you can take advantage of a 50% instant deposit bonus right now. That's 50% instant deposit bonus up to $1,000 over at MyBookie. Use promo code sleepers and happy betting. Home dogs aren't dogs, they're wolves. I'm trying to flip that into like sport, like home sports books aren't books, they're novels. We'll work on it. That didn't work. Go my bookie promo code sleepers.